pleased to be here. Um, a little intimidated by such a large audience. Um, normally, we in uh, in the company, we we're talking with a few people. Is it possible to dim the lights, Robert, so that we can see a bit better? So, um, when I was asked to do this talk, I, uh, we were given the uh, topic of indoor agriculture. So, what I attempted to do was just look at the whole spectrum of indoor growing and then look a little bit more closely at what we do um, as on large scale um, indoor, indoor gr greenhouses, which we'd certainly call indoor growing. So, um, Many people outside of the industry, when they watch the TV, they see the media, uh, there's a lot of talk about the vertical farm. And uh, Dr. Dixon Despommier uh, has been a big promoter of this. But to date, uh, most of this is really a, something in the, the eyes of the architect. So we see this uh, vertical growing uh, on the faces of buildings and things like this. Um, people have proposed designs for multi-level greenhouses, but so far uh, there's uh, really nothing uh, being built uh, commercially on this scale. Um, there are some implementations of multi-level growing. This is a system called Vertigrow, and we'll have a look at uh, the, the, f the first commercial impl uh, implementation of this in the US. We'll have a look at that a little bit later. This is a multi-level uh, lettuce and herb growing operation. So when, uh, when you do go indoors, then you don't have any sunshine, and predominantly that growing has been done with LED lights, though uh, meeting some people here in the audience from Japan, uh, they are also doing this with uh, fluorescent lamps. And this is a, um, a lettuce raising facility, and I show a little bit of work here done by a company called Plant Lab in Holland, where they're working on the recipes of wavelengths and lighting uh, regimes for producing a wide range of plants. But you will see here that all of this multi-level growing is for the shorter plants. Uh, much of what we grow uh, indoors are the vine crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, uh, and so far they have not been grown uh, indoors. Um, Gertjen Muirs from uh, Plant Lab has an excellent talk about this that's uh, available on TED if you want to go looking for it. Um, a lot of the indoor growing so far has been uh, the illegal crops, or now to legal in Colorado and places like that. Uh, and I'm so sure if anybody goes to look in the internet, you'll find a lot of stuff about this. Um, there's some very innovative solutions. Uh, this is a, a rotating growing facility that could be stacked up in a warehouse type situation um, to use all the light coming away from a light source. But to date, there's, uh, that I know of, two scaled uh, greenhouse facilities. This is a recent one that opened up in uh, Montreal and uh, this is a company called Lufa Farms. We'll have a look a little bit more about them uh, as we progress. And there's another one called Gotham Greens that has been in operation for a few years now uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, but these are relatively small operations. You'll see the, the Gotham Greens one here is uh, a little bit bigger than a quarter of an acre. Uh, the Lufa Farms, I think, is about three quarters of an acre. Um, but uh, like this, uh, the Gotham Greens, it's, yeah, you can see downtown New York from there, uh, and they are in the middle of a, a very attractive market. Um, there's many other uh, plans for these uh, rooftop greenhouses that you'll find, but again, most of them are still concept and uh, architecture drawings. So, We've talked about vertical greenhouses. Well, one way of looking at what we do today is say we work in horizontal greenhouses, uh, right? So this is the Village Farms facilities in uh, Delta, uh, British Columbia. Uh, here we have a little bit more than 100 acres of greenhouses that were built uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, we're growing tomatoes and peppers, uh, a range of tomatoes and peppers in this facility. 
Uh, we have another facility in West Texas. Uh, we have three facilities in West Texas, actually. This is one of them in a town called Marfa. Here, this is, we're looking at 80 acres of greenhouses. Uh, this was built in the mid late 90s. We have another 40 acres about 15 miles north of here. And we recently finished construction of uh, a 30-acre facility about 100 miles away. So uh, these facilities were, grow, were located in, out in West Texas for the high levels of winter sunshine, something similar to what you have here in uh, Las Vegas. And they're also located up at about a mile high. So that provides for a cooler summer. But even there, with conventional greenhouse design, it's still too warm to produce through the summer. So our new Gates greenhouse, which is actually uh, the tiny little one uh, on, the, uh, on this corner here. This was a, re a facility that we built in 2006 to apply new cooling technologies using some of the ideas about uh, air moving uh, developed on the closed greenhouses in Holland uh, that enabled us to cool the incoming air, manage the humidities, and uh, create conditions that would uh, optimize growing 365 days a year. And that, green, uh, that greenhouse led to the development of our newer facility in Monaghan's, which we'll see a little bit later. So what is our facility in Monaghan's? It's a large-scale controlled environment agriculture. It's 30 acres. I forget how many square feet that is, but it's a lot. But how would we define controlled environment agriculture? Uh, it's a production facility that controls the plant environment 24-7, 365, so that we can reliably supply our customers. Uh, our customers don't want peaks and troughs of production. They don't want to hear that, oops, we, uh, we've got a disease problem. Oops, the crop's not doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, they, need our, they need our tomatoes uh, every day. <coughs> so, what are the features really that are innovative about this facility? Well, first of all, we've uh, employed uh, diffused glass on the roof, and we will be installing uh, supplementary lighting. Now you say, if we're in the middle of the desert, West Texas, why do we need to provide lighting? Well, even in the most sunny locations, your winter sunshine levels are lower than your summer sunshine levels. So we want to add to the light energy provided to the plant so that our winter production approaches the levels that we produce during the summer. So to uh, keep uniformity throughout the greenhouse, uh, we are moving the air, we're guiding the air through the greenhouse, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. We're controlling the ventilation amounts to uh, be able to remove the most energy with each cubic foot of air that's uh, taken out of the greenhouse, and that allows us to keep higher CO2 levels. And anybody that's looking to maximize uh, production uh, in a facility will know, will tell you that we need to increase the level of CO2 within the greenhouse. It's, so a greenhouse is actually a good uh, place to use uh, surplus CO2. And we use the surplus CO2 from our heating. So the greenhouses are heated by natural gas, but those boilers actually run during the day. So while they, uh, when you burn natural gas, you get water vapor and CO2. The CO2 is uh, delivered into the greenhouse. And then the hot water that we produce in the boilers is stored in large storage tanks and then used in overnight to, um, to cool the greenhouse. We've integrated the evaporative cooling. We'll look at that a little bit more a little later. Talk a little bit more about water management. We'll talk about advanced plant monitoring. Uh, we talk about plant pest exclusion, biological control. Because whenever you're growing 365 days a year, you have to maintain all any of the plant diseases at the lowest possible levels. We don't have a situation where you can clean out the greenhouse, get rid of all your problems, start at zero, uh, and then start a new crop. No, we are growing, we have plants growing, producing fruit 365 days a year. So this is a bigger shot within the greenhouse there. This is looking through one half of the greenhouse, about 15 acres on this side. And you see these white tubes uh, underneath the... Let's see if I can find the pointer here. 
these, um, these white tubes running underneath the, the growing crop. These are the air distribution tubes. Um, we've got ventilation uh, up above the walkway. We'll look at that again uh, in, in some further slides. But anyway, before going further into that, um, this um, is a shot from our uh, facility in Delta. The, we, I hope to be able to show you a video here, but we, did, couldn't, we couldn't make it work. But it was where our growing manager uh, gave a tour to a group of chefs. And uh, we're working with that group of chefs for specific varieties tailored to their needs. And uh, I think that's very appropriate in what you're talking about here today as well. So what's the greenhouse industry worldwide? Well, this is a shot of the, the coast of southern Spain, a place called Almeria. And this is just a sea of plastic greenhouses. I believe the number now is something in the order of 50,000 acres of greenhouses. Uh, and you can see these here just uh, going off to the horizon. Uh, one of the largest uh, areas of greenhouse. Uh, we could call this lower tech or mid tech greenhouses. We actually employ more of the technology that comes out of Holland. And this is a, an aerial shot of uh, one of the areas of Holland in between Rotterdam and The Hague where also there are many thousands of acres of greenhouses. And uh, a lot of the systems that we use, the design of the greenhouse construction, the water irrigation heating systems that we employ are provided by companies from Holland. So what the state of the industry here in the US, well, you'll see here from this graphic, hopefully, yeah, you can see the numbers up there. There's um, over a thousand acres of tomato growing in the, in Canada, a similar acreage in the US. Um, five big players in that market. Uh, Eurofresh uh, in Arizona, they have something over 300 acres. We have something over 200 acres in Texas and in uh, British Columbia. Uh, Howling, I think there's a representative from Howling's company, they have 160 acres in California and British Columbia. Uh, Sunset Mastronardi, uh, they have a hundred and some acres in Colorado, Nevada, uh, sorry, um, Nebraska, Michigan, and Ontario, and they are also a very large marketer for other producers. And Winset Farms is a currently expanding operation in California and uh, in British Columbia. So this was a map really showing the locations of some of those major greenhouses. Some of these. Um, Stars aren't in exactly the right place. Um, there's one up here that should really be in Ontario. But the greenhouse production in the US, you'll find predominantly on the West Coast. Uh, there are a couple of producers up in uh, New England and a few smaller operations scattered around through the rest of the, uh, the state. But a lot of that is because with the higher temperatures and higher humidities, the eastern half of the US isn't really uh, suitable for long season growing of tomatoes. Uh, the small local operations that are providing the local market, but the big operations are California, Arizona, Texas. And then as you go further north to Vancouver, then it's cool enough uh, to, uh, to grow there. So why grow indoors? So here we see some comparisons from uh, some USDA data uh, for the field production. So in the greenhouse business, we talk about production in terms of kilograms per square meter. Now, that probably means nothing to anybody here. No, it's a, that's a, we're talking about for each square meter, which is about 12 square feet of the greenhouse, how many kilograms, so multiply that by 2.2, um, of fruit do we produce in a year? So from the field, that's somewhere in the three to four kilograms per square meter. Translate that to tons per acre, 12 to 15 would be the average. There are many growers that will double or triple that in good circumstances. And the smaller scale greenhouses, mom and pop operations, um, they may be doing 25 to 50 with medium technology. And that translates to uh, one or 200 per acre, two tons per acre per year. Um, the bigger, large scale conventional greenhouses they're pushing that up over 200 tons per acre in a year. And with these new controlled environment greenhouses, 
we're well over 300, and we expect to pass the 400 uh, ton mark. So that's you know almost uh, eight tons of tomatoes per acre per week, year, year, over the whole year, average over the whole year. Is that a hectare or an acre? And that's an acre, right? So in Mexico, there's also a lot, uh, quite a few high-tech greenhouses, but the vast majority of the acreage in Mexico are plastic greenhouses with limited uh, climate control. Uh, most of them have just ventilation because the climate is warm enough to, uh, to grow tomatoes uh, at most months of the year. Uh, so they don't have the heating and the computer control that you would see in a, a greenhouse in US or Canada. Uh, there's also uh, expansion, I think, of high tunnel greenhouses in the U.S. Uh, many growers uh, providing tomatoes and other vine crops for short season crops, mainly during the summer months. So um, ourselves, village farms and some of those larger producers you saw on the earlier slide, we want to differentiate ourselves from the other, uh, should we say, less uh, technical greenhouses. So we've joined together to form this Certified Greenhouse Association. Uh, and here, the members of this association agreed to comply by quality standards, uh, controlling the greenhouse environment for reliable production, food safety, very important. And uh, we, like, uh, most of the greenhouse businesses are uh, fully certified for food safety. We make this really one of our priorities. We have to provide a safe uh, product for our customers. So now uh, I want to sort of dive a little bit more into what we really do for ourselves. And a lot of what you could, appro you could stamp, step back and look at what we're doing and say, you know, what, what are we trying to do? Well, let's go back to photosynthesis. The plants use in sunshine, so solar energy, but it could also be uh, supplementary lighting, combine water and carbon dioxide to form sugars. <clears throat> and essentially, more, sugar, more sunshine, more sugars. But the whole process is temperature dependent. If the conditions are too cold, those sugars are just stored as starch, the plant doesn't grow. If it's too hot, they're consumed by respiration and you don't get them into your product. And you also have to balance the distribution within the plant. We'll look a little bit more about how we do that. And also, very importantly, um, if you've got too much sunshine and a poor environment, the plant goes into stress, it closes its stomata, it can't take up the CO2. So even though the sunshine is available, uh, photosynthesis is limited by uh, the ability to absorb CO2 as the plant's um, protecting itself from stress. So, we said that sunshine was the most important thing. Um, and here you can see that uh, with the diffuse co coverings on the greenhouse in Monaghan, the, the sun is coming in from all different directions. And this spreads the light in amongst the crop and has been uh, very uh, important in uh, raising the production levels. And we go to great lengths to keep that roof clean. We want to get every drop of sunshine through that roof. And this is, uh, this is uh, setting up of a roof cleaning machine that we run over the greenhouse every day. Uh, we can get across the 30 acres about once a week. And this is a little bit like those car wash brushes, and it just goes up and down each peak, moves from peak to peak, because we want to get every, like I say, it, we want the grass sparkling clean, we want every drop of sunshine to come through. But uh, we also told you that we're looking at uh, putting in the supplementary lighting. Now, uh, most of the lighting that's been applied in greenhouses, we've been using large high output lamps. This particular picture is of a thousand watt high pressure sodium lamp. And we have the, one of these for every 100 square feet in round numbers, maybe 120 square feet. And, um, so most of the application to date, the biggest acreage by far is using these large high pressure sodium lamps. But there is, some, there is work going on uh, using the um, LED lights for what's called interlighting. So in between the rows of tomatoes, uh, you're providing some extra illumination to make the lower leaves of the crop canopy 
they still also produce uh, and, uh, and create more sugars. And this is a fairly typical setup, and this is many hundreds of acres, possibly even thousand acres um, worldwide now where people are using these, uh, the big high pressure sodium lamps. Uh, I think you'll see them here. You see them here above the, above the crop. So there's a lamp over every uh, row of crop and about every 15 feet uh, in between them. And uh, they're providing, probably in, a, in the case of our greenhouse in Texas, about another 50% more light than is coming from the sun. And that helps raise our uh, produ winter production levels. So we said that to have the most efficient photosynthesis, we have to have the right temperatures and the right humidities. So in this greenhouse, uh, all the air coming into the greenhouse is coming, comes in through a pad wall. We've adapted what is referred to as a pad and fan cooling system. Um, and we created a mixing chamber on the outside wall of the greenhouse. So the uh, hot outside air comes through the pad, uh, this wet wall where it, uh, you get evaporation, cooling, humidification. And then that air is blown down underneath the crop through those white tubes. We'll see those again in a minute uh, to, uh, to distribute through the greenhouse. And you see this chamber, though, is actually is open so that we can mix cool air from the outside, well, now cooled air from the outside with greenhouse air so that we uh, always have the right mix of air being delivered into the crop. And then also, very importantly, uh, to keep uniform conditions as we go through the greenhouse to provide a little bit more evaporation than the crop is able to provide, we make uh, quite extensive use of the fogging. And uh, we have a very large fog installation in that greenhouse as well. So this is the, uh, the air tubes underneath the crop. This, this air tube has little perforations in the side that... Uh, distribute the air through the greenhouse and we work quite a bit with um, the volumes of that air and the volumes of our uh, inlet and exhaust air to uh, just balance the conditions and we've got some fairly sophisticated software that controls that. So, uh, and then the air is exhausted out of the greenhouse through uh, big fans uh, over the centre walkway. Now just to put this into perspective, the pad wall that we were looking at is actually a full 300 feet back against each, each wall of the greenhouse. So we've got 300 feet going in this direction, 300 feet going in that direction. The air is coming through the air tubes, uh, going through the crop, and it's steadily moving through the crop and then out through these windows. So what does that result for us in terms of temperature? Well, on this graph, and I hope this is relatively clear to you, the temperatures here are in centigrade, and I'll maybe see if I can translate it. But um, you'll see the temperature outside is pushing up towards uh, 38 degrees. That's about 100 degrees. It's still not quite as hot as you get here in Las Vegas, but we can keep the green temperature in the greenhouse down uh, with a maximum of about 26 or 27 degrees, which is somewhere in the mid-70s. So... The evaporative cooling combination of the, uh, the pad wall, the fog system, and quite importantly, the plant itself. Over the year, the plant is still the biggest evaporator within the greenhouse. It's still the biggest component in the cooling equation. But combining those three, we're able to reduce the temperature in centigrade, to, in Fahrenheit terms, by fully 20 or 25 degrees. And we can do that reliably every day. Uh, also, in terms of humidity, here on the, the black line, you see the relative humidity of the outside air, and then these uh, red and pink lines at the top, you can see that we're maintaining somewhere between 70 and 80% relative humidity within the greenhouse. And this is very important, as I said, uh, for photosynthesis. When there's good humidity, the plant isn't stressed, it opens its stomata, you can bring up CO2, uh, the plant can also evaporate as well. It does its own cooling. It's able to take up the CO2 and we maximize that uh, photosynthesis. So the evaporative cooling works very well in the dry climates. 
But as you move to more humid climates, then uh, work is going on now to look at uh, utilizing heat pumps, heating and cooling coils to recover some of the energy from the greenhouse in the winter situation, um, but also to um, provide dehumidification and cooling for summertime conditions. And this type of technology will have to be uh, applied when we take our greenhouses into uh, the eastern half of the US. So, all of that work we put in, hopefully we, uh, we get some uh, pretty good results. Uh, this was a shot of some tomatoes that, uh, as a grower, we look at this and say, wow, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're looking really good. So, but how do we do that? It's not, you don't just put the plants in the greenhouse, they don't just grow. Um, we've got to do quite a bit to steer that crop, to make that plant do what we want it to do. Um, it's very important that the plant puts most of its energy into the tomatoes. We can sell the tomatoes, we can't sell the leaves. So, but if you put too much energy into the tomatoes, uh, then the uh, growing head of the plant uh, here, um, there isn't enough energy and resources left for the growing head of the plant. So we're looking very closely, more at least weekly and sometimes more frequently than that, we're looking at the characteristics of this growing head of the plant. Uh, we were looking at how much it's grown every week. We look at the length of the leaves. We look at how those flowers are opening, uh, how many fruit are set. Uh, we look at the diameter of that stem. That's a very good indicator of the strength and the power. And there's also, to a grower's eye, there's a certain color that looks right, the form, the direction of the head. These are all little, little things that we learn to read that tell us what the plant is doing. And uh, here, I'd like to show you a video clip that we built with uh, some time-lapse photography, about four days of growing of the plant. And this really was a revelation to us uh, when we saw what the plant was actually doing, how the different parts of it were developing, these movements of the leaf responding to the direction of the sunshine, but also this movement at night, how the cells were expanding. You can f actually see this shoot, this shoot's growing. Uh, yeah, you can see these growing as they're going. And we believe that there's really a tremendous amount to be learned from this. Uh, as we've looked at, we've installed uh, uh, camera systems now in that new greenhouse and we're looking at, into this uh, with quite some more detail because the plant's talking to us. It's telling us what it's doing, it's telling us how it's feeling. And there's certainly a correlation here between the amount of leaf activity overnight and the strength and reserves of the crop. And uh, I'll say there's, there's probably 10 PhDs uh, to, be, uh, to be earned just by studying what the plant is doing here. So, we, uh, we do a lot of work on uh, monitoring what the plant is doing. And we have quite sophisticated weighing systems out there in the greenhouse that are actually weighing the plants minute by minute as we go through the day. And uh, this red light, th we're looking at a week here. And on this graph, on the lower part, we just have the sunshine each day. So you go through the night. Sun comes up in the middle of the day, goes, goes back down in the evening. And we're looking, we're tracing the growth, weight growth of the crop as we go through the day. And you see that on some days we get a little bit of stress and we don't get the growth. And then other days we've got everything just right and they're just, that plant just keeps on growing. Now, if you go over here to the uh, scale on the side, you'll see that we have... Uh, an average of about 500 grams of growth. This is 500 grams per square meter per day. And I'll, uh, I'll go and, uh, well, in fact, I might as well actually just show you what that relate turns into. So 500 grams per square meter per day. It's over 4,000 pounds of plant growth per acre per day. And you could take that all the way down to three pounds a minute. So if you've got an acre of greenhouses, that plant is growing and accumulated three pounds a minute. And a bit more than two thirds of that is tomatoes, the other third is the leaves and the stem. But we're literally, 
as you can see here on these days, that process is going on all the way through the day. And then when we've done that, we've got everything just right. So we really are going back and analyzing what we're doing. We're trying to balance that water uptake of the plant with the environment that it's, uh, it's got. We make sure plenty of CO2 is available, the, the light that we said at the beginning, and uh, the correct temperatures and humidity. So what's going into the greenhouse? Well, the big things are energy. So we're using electricity for uh, ventilation. We're using natural gas to provide the heating and also the carbon dioxide, as we explained. Water is very, very important, the quality of that water. Uh, that water is used by the plant. And summertime, a uh, healthy growing crop of tomatoes is going to use about 6,000 gallons an acre per day. Uh, less than that during the winter, two or 3,000 gallons an acre. Uh, but you could easily double or triple that with the cooling requirements. And certainly for the Las Vegas situation, that would be quite important. Labor. Um, big greenhouses, uh, half a million tomato plants. Um, each of those plants is touched while well, we're training the plant and putting the clip. We're taking out the shoots. We are pruning the cluster. We're harvesting a cluster off of each plant and we're removing two or three leaves off of each plant every week. So there's many millions of operations, manual operations that have to be done. Um, there's some mechanical aids, there are some developments of robotics for some of the simpler operations, but this all has to be done by people. So we, um, we've, got, we've got carts, the electric carts that people use to go down in between the rows that allow them to work at just the right height and things like that. But labor is still uh, one of the things that anybody uh, looking at to, uh, to get into the business, you've got to look at... Uh, providing uh, quite a bit of labor. And the other inputs, uh, young plants, fertilizer, growing media, bees, biological controls, these are all relatively small in terms in costs. Uh, energy and labor will be the biggest ones. You've got quite a lot of post-harvest costs, packaging, dis uh, transportation, distribution. Uh, but um, going into the greenhouse, labor and energy are uh, the two biggest costs. Water at the moment isn't a big cost, but it is a big consideration environmentally. So we've got to be looking at you know, where that's coming from. On the output, well, obviously the fresh vegetables. In the case of the vine crops, we're removing the leaves every day. Uh, and at the end of a crop, the life of a crop, and we typically take our tomato crops through about 40 weeks of production. Uh, and then a new plant is grown alongside that. We, and we take away the old vine, so we have to dispose of the old vine. And we've also got wastewater. So there's, we're recycling the uh, irrigation drain water, uh, but uh, if we've got reverse osmosis, which we do in this situation to uh, uh, provide clean water for the growing process, that creates a, a mineral-rich stream which has to be disposed of. And this is something that must always be considered in, uh, in any greenhouse operation. So all the uh, water that we, uh, we do discharge all comes to one central point and we pump it away, stored in the, uh, a lagoon, which kind of buffers the supply because a lot of that water comes in a slug around the middle of the day in the afternoon. And then it's going out to irrigation pivots and uh, we have cattle grazing there. And you can even see these on Google Earth. So this was that, uh, that greenhouse that we looked at in Marfa, and you can see the two irrigation pivots there to, uh, to the south and west. So uh, another thing, well, let me just step back. I said that uh, energy was one of the biggest inputs. Uh, electricity being uh, a very big component whenever you're looking at lighting. So there is one way that we can do this a little bit better. And that is to employ uh, big natural gas-fired generators that uh, they produce electricity, which can power the lighting. It produces heat to heat the greenhouse overnight, and that heat can be stored and used as required. And it's also the exhaust gas can be cleaned up with a catalytic converter, and that provides the CO2 that's used in the greenhouse. Uh, 
These are big investments, as soon as you talk about multi-megawatt uh, installations, uh, that 30-acre greenhouse in Texas right now will require about 13 megawatts to power all the lamps. You know, so that's already you know, quite a few hotels here on the Strip uh, in terms of power. But if you're generating this power, you're, you're using the light overnight, but you've got power, power in surplus during the day. And uh, in the right circumstances, that power can be sold. And this is actually, uh, when we looked at Holland, I showed you those slides from Holland. In Holland, this technology is widely applied. And I believe that something like 15% of all the electrical power in Holland is actually generated at greenhouses. So they're generating the power in the green, at the greenhouse, using the heat and the CO2 uh, to support the growing process, and then uh, selling that power uh, into the national grid. So this is really one of those uh, very good ways that uh, we can integrate our greenhouse operation with uh, the community. And these are uh, big, uh, big installations, all essentially they were come packaged uh, for installation and integration with the greenhouse heating systems. So up until now I talked about vine crops. That's really what we, we're growing. Uh, we looked at pictures mainly of tomatoes but we, we're growing cucumbers, we're growing peppers. Uh, we're also working with some eggplants at the moment. And there's a few other crops, vine crops, that can be grown. But the other type of crop, are the, the, should we call them the low-level crops, uh, the leafy vegetables. Here you're harvesting the whole thing. And these are, haven't been uh, grown indoors on quite the scale of the, the vine crops. But there's quite a lot of systems out there, uh, mainly hydroponic. Uh, and this might be uh, using uh, gutters with the hydroponic solutions flowing through them. You may even have the lettuce on trays essentially floating on the hydroponic solution. And here's a fairly good shot of uh, the, uh, a crop in a, in a greenhouse. This has also been employed as well in these multi-level operations. Um, there's, uh, there's some visitors here from Japan which can probably say a lot more about this than I can. Um, but the one on the left is a new installation that went into Singapore, I believe. And the one on the right is a greenhouse that's uh, been built in Vancouver and has gone into production this year. So this greenhouse, um, well actually let me step back to, to look at this um, the, the, this lettuce growing. This is actually a move. Of, a mo this is like a, um, a conveyor. Uh, and these, these plants are constantly moving around so that sometimes they're on the outside of the greenhouse, sometimes they're in the middle, so that the light can get down amongst all the different levels. This is the shot of the actual greenhouse that's on the top of a parking garage in Vancouver. Uh, and you'll notice that they're working with a long and narrow configuration, so they've got plenty of sides where the, the light can get into uh, the greenhouse. Uh, another shot on the inside, uh, quite a complicated technical installation. Uh, a lot of that is to provide uh, the irrigation water to those trays as they go past. But they're slowly rotating around on, the, on a chain conveyor here, uh, I couldn't tell you exactly the speed of these things. Uh, but the system there that's been employed there is this vertigo system. Now, in village farms, we're 200 and some acres. We're producing hundreds of millions of pounds of tomatoes. Uh, we're growing, doing everything over with quite a, uh, a range of types of tomatoes. So we've got to reach customers uh, throughout the state. There's quite a lot of work goes into marketing and packaging. Now, for, for a smaller operation here that's going to deal more directly with uh, the uh, restaurants and the uh, hotels, the packaging may not be so important, but to provide product to the retail customer, uh, it is a very important part of the business. It's not my part of the business, so I'm just going to show you a couple of slides here of the sort of things that we do. And you can only do that when you have the, the scale of operation. And here we're just showing where our greenhouses are, some of our partners, our distribution centers. But you know, we're, 
We're working all across uh, the US and uh, Canada. But there's a whole other way of approaching this. And I actually had, uh, had the pleasure of going to New York a couple of weeks ago and walking through a farmer's market there. And uh, here there was a stall that was selling leafy greens. And then if you look at the prices here, $6 a quarter pound, then I say, right, you can make some money doing this. <laughs> All right. And then I looked a little bit further along, and they were doing the microgreens, $12 for four ounces. Now, so what does that say? That says there are some niches out there where people will pay some serious dollars for what you can produce. Um, probably the chefs here aren't going to give you quite that amount of money, but, but it shows you what can be done. And what does that say? It says there's, there's many different ways of selling our product, which not just truckloads to the supermarkets. You can approach your customer uh, more directly. And this particular farmer's market was in, uh, in the center of Manhattan, uh, many different farmers providing product. And uh, we saw earlier this company, Gotham Greens. Uh, so they're on the top of that uh, rooftop in Brooklyn. They're concentrating now uh, currently on the leafy vegetables, but I hear that they have plans to build more greenhouses. I think the next one is going on the top of a whole food store. It would be bigger than this one. And they're also looking at growing the vine crops as well now to provide them directly to the store. And you can't get any closer to the store than putting it on the roof. And uh, I think this is actually in, in, in Whole Foods. Uh, they're packaging their product and really being able to stress the local uh, component. The, the greenhouse that we looked at in, uh, in Montreal, this is a very interesting concept. So here, they're not selling to supermarkets. They're actually uh, distributing to, I think it says here, 50 locations within the city where subscribers uh, are coming and collecting their weekly box of produce. And uh, this is really, uh, you know, I, I think uh, quite an interesting way of approaching things as well. Completely different. Uh, Lufa Farms, look up, look up for them on the internet. Uh, you can learn quite a bit more about it there. So, indoor agriculture, we've seen it can take many forms. There we've got the rooftop greenhouses, we've got the urban, the suburban, and the big rural greenhouses. And whatever happens here, uh, it'll be the big horizontal greenhouses that are producing the vast majority of the product. The tons are going to come from the big producers, the big acreages. But there will be opportunities for smaller producers, closer to the customer, where there's a relationship, you know, the, where the, where the con customer knows the farmer, then uh, there'll be uh, lots of business opportunities there. We can use the sunshine or we can use electrical light. Um, I forgot to say, actually, when I was back, back there, that um, to date, though, uh, LEDs, whilst they're continuing to improve in efficiency, they're still only comparable with the big high-pressure sodium lights. Um, the growing systems, they can be vertical, they can be horizontal. We've seen single layer, multi-layered. In the vine crops, it will always be a single layer production. I can't see a situation really where you're going to build a whole new floor and structure uh, and working surface uh, for uh, another level of vine crops. Our vine crops all, are already uh, 12 or 15 feet tall anyway. Uh, so, you know, we're not, we're, we're multi-layered within the crop. And uh, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. Every situation is different. So I just want to say thank you. And but there's a lot of ideas out there. This is a... a um, Another architect's drawing, but this is a project, a Sahara forest project. Now, these guys have developed some really quite interesting ideas where they're using salt water or uh, poor quality water to provide cooling, but also recovering that water, uh, the, what, the water that's transpired by the crop and, uh, and recycling it. And 
There's some small scale uh, implementations of this going on, but uh, these are people who are dreaming about uh, putting, making the, the deserts bloom again. Uh, so maybe we can do that in, our, in Nevada as well. So thank you. All right, so uh, if you have questions, we don't have the standing mic set up yet, but the acoustics in this room should be generous enough so that we can hear you. So ask away. because when you're irrigating a crop in the field, the, the crop is probably taking up, the plant itself is probably taking up a similar amount as it would in our greenhouses, but you're getting a lot of evaporation from the, uh, from the soil. Uh, so while, while you're growing in a cool, while you're growing in a cool area, um, the water consumption would be, would be similar on a day-by-day -day basis. When you're providing cooling for uh, adapting a very hot climate, then that water consumption on a daily basis will be more. But what we are able to do is that we're able to produce more tomatoes with each gallon of water that we're providing. And on an annual basis, yes, we will use more water than a, a typical farmer, but we're producing 52 weeks of the year. We're producing, as you saw in the, uh, in the table there, 20 or 30 times more product so our, wa our water usage per pound of fruit is substantially less, and I've seen numbers in the range of 10 or 20 times less water per pound of fruit uh, from a greenhouse production. Yes, sir. There's, yes, when the, when, the, when the plant's taking up water, we see that typically about 5% of that is going into growth and 95% of that is going into transpiration. The actual growth of the plant is more related to the 24-hour temperature uh, the, than the amount of water taken up. Uh, no, no, the, the weight is, is actual measurements. We have in three places throughout the greenhouses, we've got about 50 uh, plants on a very sensitive weigh, weighing system. We're weighing the, uh, the crop itself. So that red line graph that you saw growing each day through the week, that is physical increase in weight of the leaves and fruit on the plants. Uh, in the, separately to that, we're also weighing the, uh, the growing media. We weigh the water going in, we weigh the water draining out, and we, from that we can uh, calculate the amount of water being taken up by the plant. And that's, how, that's what allows us to say 95% is transpiration and cooling, 5% is remaining in the plant for growth. Oh, we've got lots. <laughs> Uh, dollars per square foot. We're talking in the, the $30 range. Now, as you go to smaller areas, now, so that $30, that goes higher with the uh, amount of technology that's installed. If you've got cooling systems, computer control, and lighting, we'll add substantially to that. Uh, it goes lower as you go for a simpler greenhouse for seasonal production but it goes back up again as you build smaller areas. I will take something on the first one. Could you talk about the labor and energy costs and percentage of revenue? Ah, it's, uh, it, it, it's quite variable, but it's in the order of sort of 20, 25% in both cases. And another question, do you typically use GEP? 
No, no, no GMC, uh, no, I don't know if any of the, uh, I don't believe any of the greenhouse operations are working with genetically modified seed. The seed breeders are able to produce quite a wide range and continue to improve the varieties through conventional breeding te techniques. Yes. Uh, well, at the moment, uh, I, I'm afraid to say that all we're able to do with it is, is landfill. But unfortunately, but what we'd like to do is we, uh, in in the case of that greenhouse in Monaghan's, uh, we're we're planting areas of the crop every few months. Uh, so we've got uh, the the vines coming out uh, over more periods of the year. So instead of coming out in one one particular uh, one particular time so we'd like to look at to getting something done with composting and that would certainly be possible uh, question right at the back uh, yeah labor is the the highest variable crop uh, highest variable cost in uh, because we have to, we're, as I said, we're, the plant is growing every week. It's growing about 10 or 12 inches. We're taking out shoots. We're pruning that cluster. The, the, the fruit takes about six or eight weeks to develop on the plant. So whenever you look at a tomato plant, you've got a sequence of uh, flowers at the top, button-sized tomatoes, tomatoes this big, then tomatoes this big, and then green ones on the bottom and then below that the ripening cluster um, so each of those operations uh, takes time uh, we make our labor more efficient by making sure that uh, all the work we're done we're doing is producing a saleable product you know so we're working with trash percentages in the low single digits um, and then in the pack house you've got to grade and, uh, and, pa and pack the product so uh, it's, this is a, a cost that's in the, in the 20, 25, 30% range, depends a little bit on the crop. Uh, the smaller the product, the more labor that goes into it, the bigger the beefsteak tomatoes have probably got the, the lowest labor cost and something like a big English cucumber, also relatively lower labor costs. Uh, we've got a gentleman here in the middle table, sir. I, th I think the, the unions uh, have come into some of the greenhouses. The, the biggest operator, Eurofresh Farms, works in conjunction with the union there. Uh, in village farms in uh, Canada and in Texas, we have a non-union workforce. Uh, we've got a question here on this table. Right. The question is, is, is are there implications for uh, CO2 enrichment uh, within the greenhouse? Um, ambient CO2 outside is somewhere now around about the 400 ppm range. Um, we're enriching to two or three times that level. So we're maintaining summertime six, 700 ppms in the greenhouse, wintertime 1,200. Uh, this build, this room now, with all of us breathing out, is probably in the two or three thousand range. Uh, typically, you know, any, any, you know, so we're we no, I don't actually know the OSHA standard, but I think it's you know up in the, in the many thousands of ppm's. Gentlemen. What about pest management and uh, sustainability issues as far as marketing goes? Right, pest management. Um, the last thing we want to do as growers is uh, is apply a pesticide. So we do uh, we do a lot to uh, el eliminate that, so we don't have to do it. So uh, in that uh, the new greenhouse, all the air coming into the greenhouse is coming through a big, very fine insect netting. So we stop all the pests coming in. Uh, within the greenhouse, we rely uh, very heavily on biological control. This is using predatory insects to to control the pest insect, and we're also um, we're also uh, working with bees for pollination. 
So whenever you, you've got bees living within the greenhouse and working every day, um, you don't want to be spraying uh, to upset them. They're a far more efficient pollinator than trying to do it by hand. And, uh, uh, and on the, for the fungal diseases where we're able to uh, manage and, uh, and reduce their incidence by management of the climate, uh, that computer control of climate is one of the biggest factors in, in keeping a healthy crop. So, uh, so uh, thank you very much.